Well, thank you very much. If all the reforms in the third plan's decisions are carried out, I would say China is going to have an economic system characterized by an effective market mechanism with an enabling government. And the economic structure in China will be closely aligned with China's competitive advantages. That means at this stage, compared to the US, the economic structure will be rather labor intensive. But in the coming years, with the rise of income, the Chinese economic structure will move towards more capital intensive, technological intensive structure. And China is likely to grow in a harmonious way. That means China will reduce the income disparity. China will also contain the corruption. And China is likely to maintain dynamic economic growth in the coming 10 to 15 years. And this should be a good news for the world, not only for China itself, but also for high-income countries, other resources abundant countries, and a poor labor abundant developing country as well. We know that China started a journey from a socialist planning economy to a market economy at the end of 1978. At that time, the Chinese system was char characterized by planning economy with price distortions, active government allocation of resources, state ownership. And the main reason for those kind of economic system to exist in China was because China wanted to build up a modern, advanced, capital intensive, technological intensive, heavy industries on the basis of a poor agrarian economies. And those kind of economic structure went against China's competitive advantages. Firm in those kind of priority industries when against China's competitive advantages, they were not viable in an open competitive market. With that kind of system, China was able to test nuclear weapons in 1960s. China was able to launch satellite in 1970s. But economic system was very inefficient. So when the time or the transition started in 1979. The per capita income in China was less than one third of the average in sub-Saharan African countries. And in the past 35 years, China started a journey from the planned economy to the market economy. China did not adopt it the mainstream recommendation of shock therapies by the Washington consensus to eliminate all the distortion in the system. Instead, China adopted a dual track approach, a gradual approach to transition. That means, on the one hand, China continue to provide some necessary transitional subsidies and protection to the older sectors in order to avoid the collapse of the sectors and to maintain stability. On the other hand, the government liberalize and facilitate the entries by the private sectors, foreign joint ventures to the sectors which are consistent with China's competitive advantages, and mostly in the labor-intensive, small-scale, more traditional sectors. And uh, this approach, as you know, allow China to maintain stability and achieve 
on the average 9.7% growth rate continuously for 35 years. I would say it's a miracle in the human history because we never observed such a long sustained period of high growth in any country, in any time, in any part of the world. And uh, during this period, China transformed itself from, as I said, less than one third of the average in sub-Saharan countries. Now China, at the end of 2013, the per capita income in China is likely to be around 7,000 per capita. And uh, more than 600 million people get out of poverty during this period of time. And that might be the reason why I had the opportunity to become the chief economist of the World Bank. And I was the first one from the developing world. But there are some prices that China pay for that. The prices was the widening of income disparities and also the widespread corruption in this process of very dynamic economic growth. So if you come to China to ask people, if they compare their different standards in the past, compared to 35 years ago, 25 years ago, 15 years ago, or five years ago, I'm sure everyone, their different standards improve. But if you ask whether they're happy or not, most of them are not happy because some other people grew richer than they did. And especially the income disparity combined with corruption. So that caused a lot of social resentment. And uh, so there's a need for China to do the changes. And I think that the third plenary session of the Chinese party last year was for the purpose of doing that. The reason was because if China did not carry out the necessary reform to deal with the social resentment, even China can maintain dynamic economic growth, there are going to be some social problems. And how to address those issues? Because those issues, as I mentioned, was a result of this dual track approach to transition. To provide transitory protections to those old large scale capital intensive industries, which went against China's comparative advantages. The Chinese government retained many distortions and mostly now in the factory markets to provide the subsidies and protection to the large scale enterprises. And the most important one is in the financial sectors. The financial sector in China is dominated by five large state banks plus equity markets. And only large scale enterprises will have the access to financial services. And a small scale, agricultural households and uh, small and medium sized enterprises in the manufacturing sectors or service sectors, although their production activity today still consists of more than 70% of China's production activities. They employ about 80% of the workers in China, but they would not get the financial services. Not only so, the financial structure with this kind of system, in effect, has some kind of financial repression. That means what? Those people who can get loans, financial services, from the financial system, they are getting some kind of subsidies. And who subsidize them? Those people who put the money in the system, but they cannot get financial services. And in general, they are poorer. And if you ask the poor people to subsidize the growth or the development of the large firm owned either by the state or by the rich people, certainly the income distribution will become you know, more and more unequal. And this kind of subsidy is kind of rent. 
So you are going to have rent seeking. That means corruption. And not only in the financial sectors, it also exists in the resources sectors. China is a resources skills countries. And resources, according to the Constitution, are owned by the state. But the loyalty for the resources in our mining and so on is almost zero. So whoever can get a license for mining, whoever will become billionaire immediately. So those kind of price structure not only contribute to the income disparity, but it also invite all kind of corruption or ransacking its economic jargon. And the plenarization, the decision to allow the market to play the decisive role for resource allocation and price determination, that means the Chinese government will eliminate those kind of distortions. And if China eliminated those kind of distortions, that means what? That means the growth in China will be more harmonious. That means income, the rules of the income disparity will be mitigated. And the rules of the corruption will also be mitigated. And not only so, the growth in China will be more consistent with China's competitive advantages because only sectors which are consistent with China's competitive advantages, their growth does not require the government active subsidies and protections. And by that, the growth certainly will make the growth of those kind of small and medium-sized firm and agriculture also will have a much better market environment. And if China can carry out all those reform discussed by Chairman Qin and my colleagues you know, Yao Yang and Yi Ping, can China maintain the dynamic economic growth? I think it's a good question, you know, everyone here concerned. Because although in the past 35 years, China was able to maintain 9.7% growth rate, a historical record. But in the last year, if you read the newspapers, one of the major themes in the newspapers is China crashing the collapsing of the Chinese economy. And how come that become a major theme in so many newspaper reports? It was because starting from the first quarters of 2010, the growth rate in China started to decelerate it continuously for 13 quarters. And by the time of the second quarter last year, the growth rate in China was only 7.5%. And uh, it was the longest period in China to have this kind of deceleration since the reform started in 1979. And many people thought the reason for this deceleration was on the one hand, the growth model in China has run out of its steam. And on the other hand, it was caused by the internal intrinsic problem. And so if you put those two together, the crash of Chinese economy seemed to be unavoidable. But I'd like to say, the main reason for this continued deceleration in China was because of external cyclical problems. We know that for any economy, to maintain dynamic economic growth, there are three drivers. One is export. The other one is investment. And the third one is consumption. And uh, due to the high income country has not fully recovered from the 2008 crisis. So their growth was sluggish and uh, export to the high income country was reduced. And that was one reason for the deceleration. And the second reason, because in 2008, all the major countries carry out counter-cyclical intervention in the investment and so on. And after four or five years, those kind of projects have been completed. And so the investment growth rate has also been decelerated. And the only driver 
was consumption. And uh, that was the reason why there was gross deceleration not only in China, but also in Brazil, in India, in other high income countries. And uh, since the deceleration was due to the external factors. So if China want to maintain a reasonable growth, China need to turn the growth into the domestic sources. And for that, I'm quite sure China has the ability to do that. Because in terms of investment, China is still a middle income country. So the potential for investment in the industrial upgrading, technological innovation, environment improvement is very large. And secondly, in spite of all the talk about the debt in China, but in effect, total debt, including central government and the local government, was only 39.4%. 39 and it was one of the lowest in the world. So the scope for the local government as well as the central government to carry out counter cyclical intervention is still very large. And China has 50% of the savings. China also has 3.7 trillion US dollars of reserve. So if you put those conditions together, I'm sure China will be able to easily maintain a growth rate between 7.5 to 8% in the coming few years. But not only the few years, I think China has the potential to maintain the growth of around 7 to 8% in the coming 15 years or longer. The main reason is that the growth in our country rely on the continued improvement in the labor productivities. And to improve the labor productivity, the mechanism, the drivers, are technological innovation and industrial upgrading. As a European country, in the process of technological innovation and industrial upgrading, there are something called an advantage of back ones, or they come from advantages. And uh, even after 35 years of dynamic growth, compared to the high income country, China today is around the stage of Japan in the early 1950s. Singapore in the mid 1960s. Taiwan and the Koreas in the mid 1970s. And for those East Asian economies, on a similar level of development, they maintain 20 years of eight to 9% growth rate. So that means technological potential there. China had another around 20 years of 8% growth rate. But if China wanted to tap into the 8% growth rate, certainly China needs to develop its economy according to China's competitive advantages so China can be competitive. And in the process, Chinese government need to play a facilitation role to overcome the externality and the coordination, coordination issue in the process of structural transformation. And those are exactly the contents of the third planner decision. So I'm in a way confident that China will be able to maintain seven to 8% growth rate in the coming 15 years and longer. And if China achieve that target, certainly it's good for the world because for the high income country today, the most important thing for them is to have a ever in large market for the export. And China's growth will provide that market hope. And for the resources of this country to maintain their prices, the most important is to have increasing demand for their resources. And the growth in China will also play the function. And for other developing country, if China continue this growth rate, China will start to relocate it's labor intensive, light manufacturing industry to other developing country like China, like Japan did in the 1960s, and Korea, Taiwan, and so on did in the 1980s. But the difference is that Japan in the 1960s employed 9.7 million workers in manufacturing sectors. Korea in 1980s 
employed 2.3 million workers in the light manufacturing sectors. Taiwan, 2 million. But this time, China employs 150 million workers in the manufacturing sectors. I'm sure in the coming 10 years, most of them will be relocated to other low wage developing country. And it will provide the second golden age of industrialization in the rest of the world. So this is quite a large pictures, but I'd like to mention, I published a book called the China Miracles exactly 20 years ago. And in that book, I discussed a lot of necessary reform to maintain China's growth. And I was very happy. Almost all the reform I recommended has been followed very closely by the 14 party congress, 16 party congress, and 18 party congress. And I only made one mistake in that book. Because in that book, I predict China will grow at the rate of 8% for the coming 20 years. But in the past 20 years, the growth rate in China was 10% per year. And so now I predict China likely to maintain 7 to 8% growth rate in the coming 20 years. I'm 62 years old now. I think that 20 years from now, I may have opportunity to come to give a talk again. And if you want to have a bet with me, uh, welcome whether my growth rate prediction will be realized or not. Maybe I'll still be too conservative. So uh, the first thing probably we should do, or someone uh, in the audience should do, to, is to take a bet <laughs> with uh, Justin on that. Okay, uh, we still have, uh, let's see, because we start uh, uh, five minutes later, so uh, we can entertain uh, one or two questions from the audience. Okay, in the middle. Thank you. Wonderful speech. Agree with everything of you, you said. At looking at the world and China and the United States over the long term, it seems to me that one of the major problems we're all facing in terms of economic development <coughs> is a surplus of labor, which will probably grow worse over time rather than better. And while I have an optimistic view on China's economic growth, as you do and other speakers this morning, I worry about the implications for implementing the growth, given that surplus. You talk about the labor supply mm -hmm. and the quality of labor. <coughs> I think that certainly now China facing the problem of agents. And, uh, but there are some remedies to that. The first one, the retirement age in China is extremely young today. For the female in general, they retire at the age of 50s. For the female, for the male, in general, 55. And as a way the aging come in, China can extend the retirement age to you know, the labor of other countries, and that will overcompensate for that. But more importantly, it's quality of labor. And you know that China invests heavily to improve the quality of labor in the past decades. And at the beginning of 2000, each year, the tertiary graduate is less than one million. And this year, it will reach seven and a more million. And I think that improvement in the labor quality will compensate, overcompensate the labor shortage issues. And uh, certainly, China also will you know, relax its birth control as discussed by Yao Yang. So for that, I think that it will not be uh, you know, a break in China's growth pattern. Hi, my name is Kevin Slayton. I'm the uh, program coordinator at China Labor Watch. And although I may not look the part, just imagine for a second that I'm a migrant worker in a factory in China. And I'd like to ask you a question from the perspective of a migrant worker. We talked a lot about the reforms today so far, and some of your colleagues have. And I'm curious, 
as a migrant worker, what does, what do these reforms mean for me or for a migrant worker in China? You've talked about some pretty scary things for some people in the lower classes of China. Manufacturing and maybe lower skilled work is going to leave in the next 10 years. Uh, corruption and, you know, easy loans at the, at the uh, local level is making it unlikely that uh, business interests are going to uh, play a balanced role with labor interests. So what do these reforms mean for the, the average uh, migrant worker in China? Thank you. Uh, good question. I think for the migration workers, the first issue is a full core system. And uh, as you all mentioned, the Chinese government now is serious about the, you know, removing the urban and the rural divide and to provide the full core registration to the migration workers so they can enjoy the same status as the urban people in terms of access to public service, education, medical care. And certainly it's a good news for them. And secondly, if the financial reform, you know, being discussed in the third plenary sessions in a decision, then it will be good for the migration workers because the first one, interest rate will be liberalized. But more importantly, it will allow the small and local medium-sized you know, financial institution to come into the system. And that will provide much more access to the you know, small and medium-sized enterprises. And that will be easier for them to get financial services. And certain that the reducing of the regulation in the you know, entry to the business and now you do not require any capital requirement. Actually, if you only have one yuan, you can register companies. And in the past, you may have to wait you know, six months or one year to get the license. Now you can immediately get a license. So all those I think is good for these migration workers. Okay, <coughs> last one. <laughs> okay, just repeat. Professor, thank you for your very um, uh, <laughs> enlightening talk. I don't want to bet against you. I want to bet with you. In the past right. years, anyone bet against me, they the lose. Bet <laughs> with you. But that being said, I'm still quite concerned. First of all, there's a debt to uh, GDP ratio which is over 200. The recent banking crisis and the bank calling in all the loans and, 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 and lines of credits. And geopolitically, we have Korea, Japan, China, and the, all the close. So there are potential tensions geopolitically, war. So I am worried in welcoming the year of the horses coming in on January 31st, it's going to be a galloping horsing race and currency wars. So it's not just the political, geo, or physical war, currency war. And we're not talking about a China still emerging. This is the second largest economy competing with the United States. So times changed. I'm concerned. So please try to uh, comfort us further. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think every problem has a solution. Certainly, it's likely to have some kind of rising rivalry between China and the US because you know, by the time of 2030, the economic size in China may become larger than the economic size in the US. So there are going to be some rivalry. But I think it's a good competition. It's a good rivalry. In a sense that even China with the economic size the same as the US, the per capita income in China will be only one quarter of the US. That means the economic structure in China is complementary to the economic structure in the US because by per capita income four times higher than China means the manufacturing sectors in the US will be mostly in very capital intensive, technological intensive. And the service in the US will be mostly in the financial sectors and those. And in China, you know, does not have competitive advantage in those kind of services. As I mentioned, if we carry out the reform of the third plenary session, then the Chinese economic structure will be consistent with China's competitive advantages. And with a per capita income of one, third, uh, or one quarter of the US, the sectors and the services that China can provide will be different from the US. And so the 
you know, in large market in the China will provide the market for the U.S. to grow. I'm sure American people like to increase their income. And uh, the growth in China will provide the opportunity for their product to help a market and so they can increase their income. So fundamentally, I think that there's a win-win of the China's growth to the U.S., to Europe. You know that you know, Michael Spence had an article to say, the secret of German miracle is the dynamic economic growth in China. Because when China grows, China demands the product produced by Germany. And so that's a win-win. And as also mentioned, it's a win-win for other resources rich country and other labor abundant country. So for that, I'm sure economic rationality will prevail eventually. So certainly tension will be there, but there's a hope. We can find a solution which is good for everyone. Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Ling. Uh, because of time, uh, let's uh, stop here and move on to the next session. But I ask you to join me to give uh, Professor Ling a round of applause.